I'd like to uh, welcome you to today's webinar, which is all about the role of the optometrist in your eye care journey. And it's going to be presented by Hamdi Amrazal. Uh, Hamdi is a health promotion officer at the Macular Disease Foundation Australia. He graduated from the University of New South Wales in 2013 with a Bachelor of Optometry, Bachelor of Science, and is currently completing his Masters of Public Health at the University of New South Wales. He has worked in various environments, including private practice, clinical research and outreach work with rural and remote Indigenous communities. So thank you so much, Hamdi, uh, for joining us, and I can't wait to hear all about your presentation. Thanks so much. So I think Hamdi is just quickly going to share his screen and uh, take himself off mute and we'll, we'll get going. Oh, sorry, Hamdi, we can't hear you. Uh, do you mind I'm, I'm sharing your screen? Oh, sorry. There we go. Sorry about that. Right, so hopefully everyone can see that. Perfect. That's great. Thanks so much, Hamdi. Oh, lovely. So thank you for that, Delaney. Um, as Delaney mentioned, my name is Hamdi and I'm the Health Promotion Officer at the Macular Disease um, Foundation. Um, prior to my time at, um, at MDFA, I used to be a practicing optometrist. And so in this webinar, I'll chronicle the role of the optometrist in your eye care journey. Um, sure many of you would have had an eye exam, but may have wondered what each test is and what we hope to achieve. And there are a lot of moving parts in an eye exam. So hopefully today I can break that down for you. As a disclaimer, the information that we provide today is general in nature. So if you had any individual concerns about your eyes or individual questions about your eyes, do contact your eye care health professional um, about your concerns or any, any questions um, particularly to your eyes. And I think I'll preface this webinar by having a quick discussion on the differences between an optometrist and an ophthalmologist. It's surprising that people do get confused by the difference. Um, and so it's something I think it's definitely worth going over. So who are optometrists? Um, optometrists are your primary healthcare, uh, primary eye care health professionals. So optometrists typically go through anywhere between three to five years of training and even more depending on the school in which they attended their optometry training. And you may typically associate them with someone who you get your glasses from. However, this is a bit of a misnomer um, as we do more than that. And hopefully we will see that as the webinar unfolds. Essentially optometrists will be your first port of call when you commence your eye care journey. Um, sometimes your GP may refer you in, especially if you're a person with diabetes needing an eye exam as part of your health management, or you may come in because there's a family history of age rate macular degeneration or glaucoma, or you simply cannot see the things on, see the sign, sorry, on the road or the print on your book and your phone. Um, you'll often find them readily available in your local mall, shopping center or town center. They diagnose and monitor for eye diseases and in some instances, particularly for diseases of the front of the eye, um, the optometrist, if they carry with them a therapeutic endorsement, can prescribe medication to address any of these um, eye diseases. And they can also refer on to tertiary care. And typically, the optometrist would refer most commonly to an ophthalmologist. And that leads me to my next point, who are ophthalmologists. Ophthalmologists are quite different on the other hand. They are medically trained professionals, so they would have spent a significant amount of time in, um, in medical school, um, would have gone through an internship afterwards for many more years um, before being able to practice as a medical professional, and then to become an ophthalmologist, have undergone further specialized training, acquiring 10,000 plus hours um, prior to being recognized as an, ophthalmology, as an ophthalmologist. They are the ones that you will typically see after being referred from say your local optometrist um, or even your GP. And depending on their further, on their further subspecialty can manage um, and treat diseases such as cataracts for which there is surgical intervention. In some cases, they may do surgical procedures for glaucoma if drops aren't an option. 
they will often perform um, injections for the eye, injections into the eye, sorry. Um, if you have, for example, macular degeneration, diabetic eye disease, or some other retinal disease. And there are many other procedures and that they can perform, but there's too many to list here. But often, they're very, often they manage very specialized eye conditions, which your optometrist um, typically won't be able to manage. So when will you see an optometrist or when will you see an ophthalmologist? Like I said, typically you'll see your ophthalmologist after a referral from your optometrist or from your GP. Um, so like I said before, the first port of call will be your optometrist. Um, when you do see an ophthalmologist, you still will be expected to see an optometrist, however, um, and that's to continue monitoring for any eye diseases um, as part of holistic care and in the case of needing spectacles, especially after cataract surgery. Now that we have a good grasp, hopefully, of the differences between optometrists and ophthalmologists, what can you expect when you see your local optometrist? Um, and so when you see an optometrist and they call you in, typically the first thing they will do is um, what, we, what we would call um, going over presenting concerns and, and case history. And this is an opportunity for you to express concerns about your eyes or what brings you in. So like I said before, you may have come in for an eye exam because there's a family history of some sort of eye disease such as macular degeneration, or you may have some trouble reading the signs or books or anything, anything that is bothering you about your vision. It's an opportunity to share more about how you use your eyes, for example, with regards to your vocational needs or any hobbies. And this can feed into the type of spectacles that you may be prescribed. Sometimes it's helpful to bring in, in these particular instances, measurements of your work settings um, be it operating computers, any machinery, any specific tasks that you do um, that you do on a day-to-day -day basis, because that can certainly help feed into the kind of prescription that we would prescribe for you. It's also an opportunity to share your own medical history. We would like to know if there's any uh, if you have any medical conditions such as diabetes, um, if you have diabetes if you have higher blood pressure, um, if you have any medical incidents in the past. And it's also a good um, opportunity to share your own family eye history. So if anyone in the family has macular degeneration, glaucoma, cataracts and so forth, now is an opportune moment to share that with the optometrist because it will feed into the kind of test the optometrist may perform and in their risk assessment of your eyes, which I will discuss later on in this webinar. So after having gone over the case history, after having discussed with you what brings you in, your own eye history, your own medical history, and all your concerns, the optometrist will then do a series of pre preliminary tests or interest tests. And that's a combination of different tests and different optometrists may do a different combination of tests, depending on what you may say during the case history, and also as a matter of personal preference. So one I'm sure many of you would be very familiar with is simply, testing how well you can see. So often you have one eye covered, if they're using your own hand or they're covering one hand for you, one eye for you, sorry. And you're looking at a letter chart right across the room and they're asking you to go down as small as you can, right down to the smallest line you're able to read. And that's a good gauge to see how well your vision is initially, be it with glasses or without glasses. Other tests you may be expected to perform would be some sort of gross peripheral vision test. So imagine looking at me, can you see things off to the side? They may test your pupils. So they may shine a bright light to your pupils and it's a bit uncomfortable, but that pupil reaction tells us just how well the, your pupils are reacting to light and the, I suppose the electrical circuit, um, if you want to call it that, that wires your eyes to your brain. It's a good way to, to test that. And they may even use something like an Amstler chart here. So I'm sure many of you would be familiar with an Amstler chart. Um, it's a good way, it's a good screen to test for any anomalies of the macula. So ordinarily, we would expect that in a healthy person with a healthy macula, you'd see a perfect grid. However, if you have any macular diseases or any macular problems, you may see distortions, areas of blurred, 
areas of wavy lines and so forth. And that tells us that there may be something happening at the level of the macula. There's a whole bunch of preliminary tests and entrances <coughs> the optometrist may do. Um, but typically this will be some of the first tests they do prior to the refraction. And so this big gadget here on your right here, that's what we call a foropter. And that's what we use to test your best vision. Um, you may better know this test as where the optometrist asks you which view is better, one or two. And in this process, we're simply scrolling through um, a set of lenses, or rather a combination of lenses that gives you your best achievable vision based on the health of your eyes. Um, so we'll be scrolling through the lenses, trying to determine what you can best see. Obviously, if you have cataracts or some form of macular degeneration or some form of eye disease that impacting on the ocular media, um, your vision may not be as good, um, but we won't be able to ascertain what best you can see until we get you behind one of these big machines here. When you do these um, tests with the Fropter, there is no wrong answer. Um, we do checks and balances to make sure that you're giving consistent answers, but at the end of the day, we're relying on you to report accurately what you think is a better view, either one, two, three, four, or if they're about the same between the two views that you're offered. Often after using this big machine here, the Feropter, the optometrist will then use trial frames, which you can find on the left here, um, to gauge your vision with something akin to what you you'll be wearing in real life. So obviously not everyone will be walking, I don't think I've seen anyone walking around with a big Feropter on their head, um, not at least for neck problems, but that thing is awfully heavy. So to gauge what you may experience your glasses to be prior to having your glasses made up, they'll use a trial frame here. So they'll simply put in your prescription of what they think initially, oops, my apologies, is your best prescription. So they'll put it on that little trial frame here, they'll plunk it on your head. You'll find that it can be quite heavy, um, but don't worry, your, your actual glasses will hopefully not be as heavy as that. And be able to wear it and if for example you need it for driving you'll be able to look around the room and maybe some optometrist will take you outside the room um, or outside onto the road even and see how your vision is with the glasses they may alter the prescription here and there just to improve the vision based on what you see for the trial frame if you need the glasses for computer or for reading they'll test your vision with the glasses on say a reading chart or in some cases some optometrists may see you in front of a computer and see how your vision is with a certain prescription. Once they have a rough idea of, once they have a good idea, sorry, of a final prescription, um, they'll then be able to determine, have a discussion with you, what kind of glasses are best for you. But I think we'll just keep that towards the end of the, um, the end of the discussion. Um, if I could just go back to this slide here, it's also a good opportunity if you haven't already to discuss any particular hobbies that you may have. So if you like sewing, for example, if you like doing crochet work or anything along the lines of, um, anything along those lines. So some people like to do machinery and get really close. Also mention that to your optometrists because they would also factor that in when you, when they do, when they prescribe you your glasses. So after having gone through the case history, after having gone through the refraction, now after having gone through the, um, the entrance test, the next test that the next assessments they would do would be your ocular health. And this is where the optometrist would use various equipment to assess the health of your eyes. I'm sure you would all be familiar with this piece of equipment on the right here. Um, and we call that a slit lamp. And as the name suggests, it shines a, a beam of light, which can be narrowed to a slit. Um, and with this, we can check the health of the eyes, starting from the very front, or what optometrists would call the anterior eye. Here we check to ensure the anterior part, including the eyelids and its immediate surrounds, things like the conjunctiva, so the whites of your eyes, the cornea, the pupil, which is the color part, sorry, the iris, which is the colored part of your eyes, are all nice and healthy. And we also have a look at the lens and see if there's any signs of any cataracts and to what extent the cataracts are progressing. I'm not sure if you're able to see here, but there's a small probe here. Um, if I move my mouse, here we go. There's a small probe here. Oh, it's covered by the eyepiece. 
and attached to a split lamp, there's a small probe and that can be used to measure the pressure of your eyes. Um, some places do it this way, other places will do it other way. So you may experience a puff of air, you may experience a portable version of a blue probe that touches your eyes, or you may feel a slight tickle, uh, a slight prick by a machine that slightly, that lightly tickles your eyes. And there are different ways of measuring the pressure of your eyes. So after having checked the front of your eyes, there's the back of your eyes, which we will need to check. And so to do that, often they'll put a small condensing lens or a very small magnifying lens in front of your eyes, in between your eyes and the slit lamp. And that allows us to have a look at the back of the eye or what we call the posterior pole. So this includes the optic nerve head and the macula. And we're looking out for diseases here, such as macular degeneration, any signs of glaucoma, or any, any sorts of anomalies at the back of the eye. If, you had, if you've had an eye exam before, you'd probably experience this as a very, very bright light that's shined into your eyes. And often you can see the slit. Um, it's not the most comfortable way to have your eyes assessed, but it's a very, it's, it's a very um, compared to say a, a retinal camera, it gives us a lot more detail that some retinal cameras would miss out on. Now, often we can't get a great view of the back of the eye, of the macula and the optic nerve head, and that's for various reasons. Um, the, young, the older we get, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on which way you look at it, the pupil does get really, really small. And so we do need to dilate the pupil so we can have a good look at the back of the eye. In many ways, it's like looking for a pinhole. The smaller the hole we look through, or the smaller the pupil we look through, the less we're able to see at the back of the eye. And the, and the more inferior quality in terms of the image we're looking at. So what often the optometrist would do would be to dilate your pupil. So in this particular instance, um, they'll put some drops in your eyes or dilate your pupils. So it looks like you've got really, really big pupils. Some people may be worried for you at that point in time for various reasons, but you won't be able to drive or find great difficulty in driving. So we recommend that you don't drive after having your pupils dilated. And what that allows us for, to do is to really have a good and thorough look at the macula, have a good thorough look at the optic nerve head and the peripheral retina as well, which in, in the case of people with diabetes um, can be impacted. So especially if you're, if you're a person with diabetes, this becomes routine as part of an eye check um, because what, not only do we assess, excuse me, the center of the back of the eye, but also the very peripheral periphery, sorry, of the back of the eye. With the pupils dilated, it's also an opportune moment to perform scans such as an OCT scan, as can be seen by the machine here on the left. Um, and it's a very important tool in diagnosis and management of diseases such as age-related macular degeneration, glaucoma, diabetic eye disease. And in, in some ways, it's akin to an X-ray. So what the machine does is it takes scans of the, of the macula, and not just scan, when, when I say scan, sorry, it scans the individual layers of the macula and tells us to, and it tells us at the very fine cellular level, not cellular level, but very close to it, um, any an anomalies that we would expect to see in someone with macular degeneration. So um, it's a very good way to, as a baseline, um, to monitor any very, any discrete changes, any small changes that often can't be picked up by say a fundus camera um, and really when a picture says a thousand words and OCT says many more many more words than that. Um, and you may again like I said before have a retinal photography done which is when they take a photo of the back of the eye. And I think most places do that today do that as part of a typical eye exam. Okay so You've got, you're at the optometrist, you finish your, you finish discussing what brings you in for the day, they finish doing the entrance tests, they finish doing the refraction, they finish doing the ocular health, nearly there, home stretch, what happens then? Um, and so at this particular point of the exam, um, we go over, we surmise the results of today's eye exam, and we also lay out a plan of action. Here, the optometrist will summarize the results of the exam and when taking into account the reason for your visit or your concerns, formulate a plan of action. Typically, 
a discussion would occur here about the kind of spectacles which best meets your needs. Um, so it, in some cases, you may need a pair of multifocals or you may need two pairs of glasses, a pair of multifocals. And if you do oh, a glass, let's just say for day to day, and you may need a pair of glasses specifically for the computer. Again, it depends on your needs and what, and what you would like to see clearly, I suppose. Um, and so a discussion of your glasses and then a discussion on your diagnosis. So if, if your eyes are healthy, that's great. There's not much else to discuss except things you can do to mitigate the risk of developing any eye diseases. But if there's a discussion to be had about a diagnosis such as macular degeneration, diabetic eye disease, glaucoma, or any other eye disease, at this point, that discussion would be had. And so typically the optometrist will provide you information about what stage of, your, of the disease you're at, if at all, and what can be done, including treatment or self-management procedures. So for example, as a, as a case study, I suppose, let's discuss macular degeneration. Suppose you've been diagnosed with the very early stages of macular degeneration. What can be done? Um, the optometrist here we would, may have a discussion with you about um, dietary changes, um, about living a healthy lifestyle, as this all can reduce your chances of, mac of developing further macular degeneration. If you smoke, um, they may advise you to see a GP and to consider um, smoking cessation. Um, if you have diabetes and your eyes are healthy, then the optometrist may have discussion about the impacts of diabetes on your eyes and what you can do to minimize or mitigate rather the impacts of diabetes on the eyes, such as controlling your diabetes. If you're having trouble reading things, they may suggest over and above glasses, environmental changes. So things such as increasing your lighting or reducing sources of glare. And where necessary, they may discuss with you the need for a referral. You may not need a referral, you may just need to see the optometrist every year or two, but if you need a referral to the optometrist, or, sorry, to the ophthalmologist, they'll tell you why that referral is needed and the importance of the referral. This is also your opportunity to take control of your eye exam and your eye health. In fact, I mean, you can ask questions now, but I would highly encourage for you to ask questions at any time during the consult itself. So during the whole procedure, if you had any questions, if you're unsure why things are done, um, just ask. It's, it's, it's your eyes. The optometrist will be more than happy to answer any questions that you may have. So don't feel like you're burdening the optometrist, you're holding them back, no. If you had any questions to ask, do ask them. And I used to appreciate questions that patients used to ask me because I felt like that they were being engaged in their eye, eye care rather than being a passive recipient. Um, I highly encourage you to be active recipients in your healthcare. If anything is unclear, ask further questions. If have, you can have someone there with you. If you're uncomfortable, or if you're having trouble understanding the language or, or if you need someone to translate there for you, of course, it's pending any COVID restrictions. Because um, it can be quite overwhelming when you've been diagnosed with an eye disease, such as macular degeneration, glaucoma, cataracts, and so forth. So if you need anyone there for support, you're more than welcome to have that. You're more than welcome to have them with you. It's also important to remember that the optometrist is with you every step of the way and will be in the position to offer you support or direct you to the support services you need. And so this leads me to my next point. What can an optometrist provide? So as I mentioned before, they'll provide you with information advice. So they'll give you information about your diagnosis and advise you on how to go ahead um, dealing with it, um, the next steps going forward. So advising you on ways to manage it yourself or if you need to see a specialist um, and advise you of the review periods. Um, the kind of information, like I suggested before, they may provide lifestyle and dietary changes as well as environmental changes. They may provide referrals. So at the moment, I've only emphasized referrals to ophthalmologists, but they can do more than that. Um, they can refer to imaging services such as um, the Center for Eye Health. If the optometrist doesn't have ready access to an OCT, um, they're able to refer to fellow optometrists. So for example, if you have a problem with the cornea, for example, you've had corneal grasp before, 
Um, they may refer you to an optometrist who's comfortable fitting hard contact lenses. They can refer into support organizations such as us. So if you've been diagnosed with macular disease, we're more than happy to field any questions you may have about, um, about your recent diagnosis of, of a macular disease. And they can refer you into other support organizations such as Vision Australia and Guide Dogs, particularly if you have low vision and need low vision aids, or if you need help with low vision and getting out and about. These last two organizations, Vision Australia and Guide Dogs are particularly helpful. How often should you see an optometrist? And that's a tough question, actually. Um, you would think it's an easy question to answer, but it's actually not. And in part, it really depends on the individual. Assuming you're aging healthily and that there's no eye problems, if you're less than 65 years of age, every two to three years should suffice. Um, and if you're over the age of 65, then annually would be a good would, would be the recommended guideline. However, if you have any disease, not just macular disease, but a disease of optic nerve heads, such as glaucoma or any other, any other disease, that review period can be much shorter. So you could be seen anywhere between every month, say, in cases of A and B that has a high risk of becoming wet macular degeneration, um, to every 12 months, for example. So that really depends on the severity of the disease um, and the risk of any further vision loss. And I guess that also then segues into the, into the next thing I wanted to talk about. And I mentioned the risk of macular disease. What does that mean? What does it mean to be at risk of macular disease? Um, and it is important to know if you're at risk of developing macular disease or at risk of developing vision loss from macular disease. And your optometrist is someone who can help you assess the risk and help you mitigate the risk. So for example, if you have a direct family history of age-related macular degeneration, you have a 50% risk of developing it also. With regards to age, one in seven people over the age of 50 have some sort of A and B and the, the incidence, sorry, of macular degeneration only increases with age. Um, again, just to touch upon AMD, if you smoke, you increase the chances of developing AMD significantly. And the presence or, or, or severity of macular disease may also prompt heightened action and shorter review periods, as mentioned before. Um, so if you're in people with diabetes, um, if your blood sugar levels are elevated, or if you have um, comorbidities such as your high cholesterol or higher blood pressure that's not well controlled, um, your optometrist will be able to assess your risk then, um, put you in a higher risk category, and mitigate and, and sorry and commence some sort of action to mitigate that risk. So that may be a referral back to your GP to have those under those um, reviewed and assessed and controlled better. Um, and so it's, a, it's important you see optometrists because they're able to assess the risk and see how we can best mitigate it. Um, so knowing that you're at risk, the optometrist, like I said before, and this is somewhat going over what I've mentioned before, um, your optometrist is the first port, of, first port of call. So they consider your family history, they assess the, assess the health of your eyes and formulate a plan of action that can best mitigate your individual risk of macular disease. And like I mentioned before, this may include setting regular review periods, um, dietary advice and supplements in conjunction with your GP, of course, um, to mitigate the risk of macular disease. Um, like I said, refer to your GP to have your blood assessed or onward referral to a specialist for any treatment to reduce any, fifth, any further vision loss or prevent any vision loss. Um, this, is by no, this, this list is by no means exhaustive, but as some of the considerations an optometrist may take into account. Um, they can also provide tools for self-monitoring, such as the prescribing of an ambler chat, and that allows you to monitor your vision on a daily basis. And importantly, uh, if you notice any changes to your vision, especially if you know you have diabetes or macular degeneration, you should see your optometrist immediately as this may mean something has happened to your eyes and warrants immediate intention. 
it may mean you need to see an ophthalmologist as soon as possible um, to prevent any further to prevent any further vision loss. But that may not, that that may not always be the case. Um, again, the optometrist will be able to triage this, assess your risk, and sometimes in conjunction with the ophthalmologist office, get you in much quicker um, through this triaging process. Um, in summary, it is a quite a short talk today. Um, I thought I'd leave it open for um, the questions and hopefully there's many questions here. Your optometrist will often be the first person in your eye care journey. Um, often the first person to diagnose any health problems with the eye will be the optometrist and help you in managing these particular conditions. And I don't think I've stressed it enough, but it is important to have regular eye checks with your optometrist and maintain these appointments because in, because in that way we can detect the slightest changes to your eyes and get on top of any possible um, risks um, posed to your vision. And I think I will end it there.